Well, hey, friends, uh, Mark chapter 12 today, we continue in our talking on discipleship and what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Um, and as I said to the kids, and I apologize for taking a bite of peanut butter sandwich with the microphone right next to my mouth, uh, we're talking about taxes, taxes and death, actually. Um, and Benjamin Franklin famously said the two things that are guaranteed in life are death and taxes. Uh, we can't get away from them. Interestingly, that this is something that apparently was also concerning in the ancient world as well, that they've always existed to some degree. And so we're going to talk about these, but we're really going to talk about like what I said to the kids about is what actually matters in life, what matters most in life. Because we're going to spend time thinking about these things. We're going to obsess about these things. We're going to worry about these things. We're going to question the, but what really matters. So we're going to have a couple of stories about this as Jesus is teaching in the temple courts. Uh, as a reminder, he's already come into Jerusalem. They've honored him as king. He's cleared out the temple courts of all the commerce. And now there's dialogue and teaching, and everyone's kind of going through these things together. So verse 13 is where we're going to start in Mark chapter 12, and we're going to read through 17 to start, and then we're going to talk about taxes a little bit. Later, they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to, catch G to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? He asked. Bring me a denarius. Let me look at it. So they brought him the coin and he asked them, whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. Okay, so the Herodians who are just um, ethnically Greek Jewish people and the Pharisees, and they're all kind of on the same team. If you remember way back when, in like chapter three or four of Mark, they agreed they needed to kill this Jesus guy. So they're still working on it. They're still trying. Hasn't worked yet, but we're getting close. And uh, he's in the temple courts teaching and they come to him. And um, as... Just as a heads up, um, all of these people, as a reminder, if you haven't been here the last couple of weeks, all of these people are coming to test Jesus. All of these people are coming to try and trick Jesus. And, and they, they bring up taxes for a very important reason. This was a line everyone sort of had to toe here, right? Because Rome was occupying them. And so if, if they say, don't pay Roman taxes, then they're against Rome. But if they say, oh, absolutely pay the Roman taxes, then they're not being true to Israel and what, you know, who we are as a people. So how do you tow this line in kind of the middle? And their first method is, um, okay, we're just going to try to butter them up. If you look, it says, you know, <laughs> it says, teacher, you're a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others. You pay no attention to who they are. You teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Very different than how they've been interacting with him. Uh, maybe they've changed tactics or something. We don't know exactly. Um, but they were wrong about one thing. It says he pays no attention to who they are, which might be true, but he does pay attention to their heart, right? He does show partiality to how people approach him and how we come to Jesus. But again, this tax issue. The tax issue is a really big one because if, we, if you've never heard this or never heard kind of this talked about in the ancient world, taxes were really unfair. Tax collector had a minimum they needed to collect, but they often would collect much more than they needed to. And there's nothing you could do about it, especially if you were a Jew in this area in this time. There's nothing you could do about it. Rome gave authority to tax collectors, and tax collectors would often take much more than they needed to. We see this with the story of Zacchaeus, right? That Jesus goes to Zacchaeus' house, and he says basically, hey, I'm going to give back everything I've cheated people out of because that's not right anymore. And, and they wanted, now bear in mind, they also just welcomed Jesus as a king two days ago. They wanted their Messiah to come in and overthrow Rome so they would be free from these taxes, right? So this is not just an innocuous question. This is not a simple question. This is a very, very loaded question they're asking Jesus. What side are you on in this argument? Where will you land? Very important to them. And they do this because they know if he answers this way, we'll have him. If he answers and says, no, don't pay the taxes to Rome, then we'll tattle and we'll tell Rome that this guy says not to pay taxes and Rome will arrest him and then Rome will solve our problem. But the other way, if he says, yes, absolutely, pay Rome, doesn't matter, all these things, whatever, then maybe we can get him on the religious grounds and tell people he's not actually going to be their Messiah and they'll stop following him. So they've come up with this plan and they come to him and they say, okay, 
Should we pay or shouldn't we? Verse 15. Do we do it or do we not? So, Jesus. Jesus is brilliant, isn't he? Uh, we know he's Jesus, great. But he's very clever because he knows people's hearts and he knows what's going on. And, and, and as a reminder, just remember the context too. Two, two, two or three stories ago, he's driven out the money changers. He's gotten out all the commerce. And so he's just focusing on worship. He's keeping worship where worship should be. And so he says, all right, hey, do you have a coin? Now, notice here that Jesus doesn't have a coin. Um, Jesus doesn't have one, but they happen to have one. He says, bring me a coin, bring me a denarius. So they bring him the coin, and he says, okay, whose image is on there? They say Caesar. Whose inscription? Caesar's. Okay, so here's the issue, you guys. Um, here's the problem. You're trying to trap me with this issue, but here you are. You're using these coins. You're benefiting from this system. You're operating within this system, and you're trying to use this to trick me and to trap me. And, and, and additionally, what's really fascinating about this is not only this, but from a level that's not directly explained here, um, was Caesar just a king or an emperor? Or did they consider Caesar, if you've ever, have you guys ever heard this before? They considered Caesar a god, right? Now, what Jesus is doing here is really, really fascinating. He's saying, not only are you guys all benefit, you guys are using these coins in the temple, you have commerce, you have all these things. So you're benefiting from the financial system that we're a part of right now. But not only that, you might actually be breaking your own laws by carrying around idols in your pocket. Whose face is on the coin? Caesar. Doesn't Caesar say he's a god? Isn't that idolatry? You have no problem, and, and before Jesus got there with all the commerce that was happening, you have no problem having commerce and bearing or having images of a false god into God's temple and benefiting from it. You're walking around with this, these coins and walking around in this system, benefiting from it, keeping it in your pocket. So why are you trying to trap me with this? You are more hypocritical than I've ever been. So you know what? Here's what I'm going to say to you. You give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and don't worry about it anymore. Give to God what is God's. See, what Jesus is doing is separating the world they live in from the worship God designed. It's almost like we could say a separation of church and state in some ways. But really, truly, Jesus is saying, listen, this is the temple. This is the house of God. Give to God what is God's and give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Why are you trying to confuse the two? So, so brilliant. And this is where we enter into our direct implications for us now today in our day and age. Yeah, we can talk about separation of church and state to use American constitutional language. We could talk about paying taxes. We can make jokes about paying taxes and how it's unjust and everything. But friends, the reality is, is that we just don't need to worry about this stuff too much. I hate to oversimplify it, but if you were to ask me what the main takeaway from this is, I would say there's a couple of them, but the main idea is this. As Christians, we don't need to worry about trying to completely change and take over the government. They're coming in. Jesus is say, they're saying, Jesus, be our king, be our Messiah, get rid of these taxes, fix all the problems. And Jesus says, that's not my problem. Like, the Roman government is not my problem. Their tax structure is not my problem. I'm not even going to address it. Give to God what is God's. And that's what you need to focus on. We don't need to overthrow Christians today. I say this all the time. We don't need to overthrow the existing government if we disagree with it. And we also don't need to run away and hide out in the desert and in the wilderness living off the grid and refuse to pay taxes. I think both are a little extreme. Friends, we have been put in a place to live and to operate. And there are governmental things. There are taxes. There is life. There's roads. There's hospitals. There's schools. We all have our duty. We all pay into it. It's not perfect. So we vote. We try our best. But we move on. Do not try to bring the two together. Because then what happens is we make things that should be about worship and about giving to God what is God's. Instead, we make it about other things. And this is something we all are tempted to do. Jesus talks about money a lot in the Gospels. In fact, the two things he talks about the most are money and the poor. And one of the things he says over and over again is basically, don't worship money and don't let it become an idol. And if we're focused so much on taxes and government and regulations and all of these things and letting it affect our spiritual life and taking away from what we're designed to give God, we might be doing things out of order. 
And it's a simple passage, but I love it so much. It's, it's a great phrase, and we use it all the time, and we're familiar with it. Just give to Caesar what is Caesar's. It's okay. Essentially, just don't worship money. Don't allow that to be something that keeps you from worshiping God. And so, as if money wasn't a big enough issue, then another group comes to him and says, well, okay, fine, that's the money thing. Let's talk about death. Uh, verse 18 to, 18 to 27. Then the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers. The first one married and died without leaving any children. The second one married the widow, but he also died leaving no child. It was the same with the third. In fact, none of the seven left any children, and last of all, the woman died too. At the resurrection... Kind of a goofy story, right? Think, man, this must have been normal in the Old Testament, but not normal today. At the resurrection, whose wife will she be since the seven were married to her? Jesus replied, are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like angels in heaven. Now about the dead rising, you have not have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the burning bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. Okay, so now we have, if you were reading Mark like a book, now we have a new character. We have the Sadducees. They haven't been in it up to this point. And the Sadducees are a far conservative wing of Judaism that held the five books of Moses, the Torah, the Pentateuch, First five books of the Bible is the highest authority, right? These are the, the most ultra-conservative Jews of the day. And the Sadducees would say that after the five books of Moses, the other ones help and understand, but this is the true authority. And so they try to trick Jesus using the books of Moses. And the law they choose is about marriage. And the reason is, is because they don't believe in the resurrection. But Jesus has talked about the resurrection, right? Jesus had said three times, he will resurrect. And so there's a tension going into this. They say, okay, so you believe there's going to be some sort of resurrection. They believe that once you die, you're dead. So who's right? What's happening? So they use an argument from the law of Moses about marriage. And the argument is a little extreme, but it basically says that if a man and a woman were married and the man died before she had any offspring, it was the brother's duty to make sure she had children to care for her in her old age. But he uses, they use an extreme example to say, imagine there's seven brothers and they all marry this woman. It's weird. And, and there's no children. <laughs> what happens then? So you say there's a resurrection, Jesus. Then what happens? Who's the husband? And then Jesus, maybe, maybe, um, maybe one of his more sarcastic lines in all of scripture. Uh, verse 24, he says, wait, wait, wait. Are you asking me this because you don't know scripture or you don't believe in the power of God? He says this. First of all, you need to understand that when the dead rise, they will neither be married nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. It's just one verse, but it's very, very important for us to realize. Um, and I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but marriage will not exist in heaven, nor will we marry others in heaven. Now, this is really important, actually, and it affects, we talked a couple of weeks ago about marriage, but it's a really important thing to understand because sometimes the church has elevated marriage so highly as the ultimate goal that it's like get saved and then get married. And, and what's hard about that is as many people in this room know, some people are never married or some people marry someone who is maybe not a good person or changes their mind or leaves them or divorces them or some of you have divorce and some of you have brokenness. And then what happens is if we lift marriage as the highest thing in the church, then now a ton of people in the room are dealing with shame and guilt because their marriage doesn't look like everyone else's marriage. Jesus actually says something really powerful here to say, listen, marriage is something you choose to, and like we talked about with the marriage passage back in Mark 10, Marriage is something we can opt into for this life. Marriage is something that is a gift from God. It can be a good thing, but it is not eternal. What is eternal is our relationship with God. Really fascinating. And so he says to the Sadducees, listen, you, first of all, your premise is wrong. So you don't even understand the foundations of the scriptures. So your question is silly because it operates on a false premise that we're going to be married in heaven. So your example is silly. But then let me talk to you about the power of God. He says, you don't even understand the power of God by asking this question. And then his proof comes from Exodus chapter 3, the story of Moses and the burning bush. 
Now, again, the Sadducees believed the first five books of the Bible were authoritative. This is from Exodus, from their books they studied. And so rather than a prophet or a psalm or something like he's done with other people, remember last week he quoted a psalm before Isaiah. Here he quotes Exodus 3, because this is what they needed to hear, and says that God is a God of the living. Otherwise, why wouldn't he have said, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? So what does this mean for us today? Well, marriage, as I said, is not the end-all, be-all. It is a gift if we choose to enter into it, but it is not for forever. And we could talk more about that another time, but this is also why marriage is not a salvific issue and why marriage is not essential, and we need to know this. This is not the ultimate authority. I talk to so many young people who think, okay, you grow up, you go to college, you get a good job, then you get married. That's the goal. And I say, no, no, no. That's a choice. It's not the goal. The goal is Jesus. So first. Second, what was he talking about with the power of God in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Well, this is important to understand a little bit of Hebrew, but when God said this to, to Moses at the burning bush, he said, tell them what I am. God, when he gives his name, I am, Yahweh, as we call it, is present tense. It is ever present. And so what he's saying basically is this, is why would God say I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? If, it was, if, if all of these men died and are no longer living, then he would have said, I was the God of your father, Abraham. I was the God of your, of your forefather, Isaac, and Jacob. And so Jesus' argument is basically like, listen, do you not understand the power of God that these three are still alive and risen in some way with God? We don't know how. We don't know exactly where they are. Are they in heaven? Are they? We don't know, and timeline's not the issue. What he's saying is, is God is powerful enough to raise all from the dead. Otherwise, he would have said this very differently. And so when God says this, Jesus is saying from Exodus, this is how we ought to interpret it, that God is the God of the living, and that those who died will raise again. So taxes and death. <laughs> are we worried about these things? Yes. But are they what really matters? No. Should we really worry about money? Should we be responsible with money? Yes. Should we worry about it? No. Should we worry about what happens after we die and what happens with marriage and remarriage and all of these things and the details about how it's going to happen? No. We know Jesus says he promised to go and prepare a place for us. That's good enough. Let's not worry about what happens after we die. Let's worry about today. Pastor Sam, how do we know what to deal with today? We have taxes and death and all of these other stressful things. Bonus third story. Verse 28. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. So all this stuff is happening. There's the, the taxes argument. There's the, the, the death and resurrection argument. And one of the teachers of the law, we don't know his name. I wish we had his name. Such a hero, this guy. Hears, though. He's on the fringes, and he's listening, and he's listening. And so after this, he goes to him, and he noticed that Jesus had given really good answers. He really likes Jesus' answers. And he asked him, of all the commandments, which is most important? most important one answered Jesus is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. This guy's a hero. I wish we had his name. He's sitting there and he's listening and he's sitting there and he's trying to take stock of what's going on and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law and the Herodians and the Pharisees and all these people coming at Jesus with aggressive, aggressive answers or aggressive questions, trying to trick him, trying to trap him. And he's sitting there listening, and he's taking it all in, and he likes what Jesus is saying. He thinks Jesus is properly interpreting the Old Testament. So he goes to him and says, okay, um, so just help me understand that. If it's, if it's not about the taxes, if it's not about the death, if it's not about all resurrection, what is it about? What's the greatest commandment? And Jesus says the two things that we've heard so, so much, which is what? What really matters? God is one. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. These are the two greatest commandments, and we've heard them over and over and over again. <laughs> excuse me, that is what really matters in this life. And we talk about this all the time, but there's a reason for it. It's because Jesus talked about it all the time. Jesus' direction with all the disciples was to go towards this. 
Look at verse 32. This is when it really clicks, or 33, rather. He said, yeah, you're right in all those things. So basically what you're saying is, Jesus, we need to love God with all our heart, and we need to love our neighbor as ourselves, and that's more important than all the ritual, than all the church services, than looking good, than having all the answers. That's Wait, Jesus, that's more important than all the rules and regulations that the Pharisees and the Jewish people have put on me my whole life? Is it... They, what you're saying, Jesus, is that loving God and loving people is the, is the direction of my life. And Jesus saw that he answered wisely and said, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, how much do we want the kingdom of God to come to earth? It doesn't matter what the top five news stories are. They all make us want God to come back. And we look and we wonder, I want the kingdom of God to come. How do I do this? How do I do this? Right there. But Pastor Sam, you always say, love God, love people. Yeah, because that's what Jesus always says. We talked about this this last Wednesday night at our community night thing. When we were talking about the covenant affirmations and the mission of the church and what is our goal and how are we doing these things. And, and this is a line from Wednesday night that I wanted to share with everyone because it helps me understand it so much. What is our mission in life? How do we bring the kingdom of God to earth? It's this. Mission is where the great commission and the great commandments meet. Mission is where the greatest commandments, love God and love people, and the great commission, therefore go into the world and baptize all people in the name of Jesus. When those two things come together, when we're loving God and loving others, and we go out into the world to tell people about this love, that is where we hit the mission. That is our goal of the church. That is the reason we are here. That is the reason you are a disciple. That is the reason Jesus Christ died for you. That is the mission, Jesus. It's not the perfect marriage that lasts for all eternity in heaven, because it's not going to last for all eternity in heaven. It's not having all the money in the world so the taxes don't bother you, because you're never going to have all the money in the world. It's not the things that the world says are the most important. It's this. And this means that we as Christians, as disciples, cannot separate what we do on Sunday mornings from our lives the rest of the week. This means that as a disciple of Jesus Christ, if you claim the name of Jesus over your life, you are to love everyone in this world, regardless of race, ethnicity, perspective, background, religion, whatever. That we are willing... Now, remember the whole passionate, engaged, willing thing? Think about this. That we as disciples are willing to step out, engage in the world with the things we're passionate about. So if you believe this stuff, if you're going to take communion today and say, I believe Jesus Christ died for me, then we need to be willing to take that into the world and engage with people the way Jesus did it with his disciples, because that's what mission is. Do you notice that all the teaching Jesus has done to his disciples throughout the gospel of Mark has been out and about? talking with people, walking with people, hearing their stories, healing people, broken people, people who disagree with them? How much of it is done in a classroom? The only times it's private is after a day when the disciples are confused and like, hey, Jesus, can you please explain what in the world you did today? It's the only time it's private. The rest of the time, it's always public. Brothers and sisters, death, taxes, yes, they will get you, but it's not what's most important in this life. That God is a God of the living. He's the God of right now. And we sometimes think, and I want to end with this, we sometimes think that, okay, yeah, Sam, I'll do this in the next season. I'm just so busy. It's so hard. I'm so, there's so much going on. I just, I'm just going to wait to get through this time, and then, I'll, and, then, and, then I'll, and then eventually, and then next year, and then eventually. I'll get. <clears throat> do you realize that God doesn't waste time? There are no stop gaps in being a disciple and loving God and loving people and taking this stuff to the world. There's no in-between time. God's not waiting for you to be ready and equipped. God is waiting for you to do it. And so often as Christians, and if I sound aggressive with this, I'm so sorry. So often as Christians, we just think, okay, I'm just waiting for heaven, just waiting for heaven. Jesus, come back. Jesus, come back. No, 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 no. What is most important? Doing it now so the kingdom of God comes to earth now. Heaven will come. But it's not yet. Brothers and sisters, if this sounds aggressive, I'm sorry, but you know what? Worry about death when you're dead because you can't control it. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. It's not yours anyways. What really matters that God is one, love God, love your neighbor as yourself, and this is for today. 
Look and see right now, what can I do today? How much work can I do to bring the kingdom of God today? And every single one of us is going to have a different answer and a different story. Every single one of us. So what is it? Where has God placed you? Where is God calling you? Where is God equipping you? Where is God pushing you? Where are you a little uncomfortable to step out? I'll tell you one of mine. Um, so we work at Donaldson with our school, and, and my son is now in kindergarten there. And it's really funny because I'm a parent there, but I'm also a pastor of this local church. And the principal came up to me on, on uh, Thursday after school. He's like, Sam, Sam, pastor, pastor, like running out as, as we're leaving the school. And I said, yeah, what's going on? And he said, hey, I'm so sorry. I forgot to ask for this thing. Could you guys get some volunteers? I know you've offered to help in the past. Blah, blah, blah. And, and it's funny because he's like, I feel so bad asking you as a parent, but I know your church might want to help and all of these things. And I just said, hey, it's fine. I'll ask if people want to come help paint, they'll come help paint. That's why we ask. And, and, and what's happening now at my, at my son's school is, yes, I'm my son's father, but they're also knowing me as a pastor. And, so, and another person in my son's school came to me and said, oh, do you guys still do the drive through trunk or treat? I said, yeah. And she said, oh, that's great. My son's autistic and my other son's not. And it's really hard to go door to door trick or treating with both of them. We love drive through trunk or treats so I can have both my kids together with me. And I'm realizing that what God is calling me to do is to love my neighbors at my kid's school and all these other things. And as much as I just want to be another parent who goes and does normal stuff, then I'm getting known as Pastor Sam. And that's okay too, because that's what God's calling me to. What is God calling you to? Look and see, what can I do right now? How can I work right now towards experiencing like this teacher of the law? Like I said, I wish we knew his name so we could celebrate him, but this teacher of the law who finally connected that the thing that was most important is not what we do what Sunday mornings, but what we do with the rest of our lives. Would you pray with me? God, thank you. God, we confess this is hard, but we know it's what we are called to do. And so we ask that you would come to us, that your spirit would be with us, that you would equip us, that you would reveal to us our gifts and our passions that we could go out and live like this. God, teach us what these things mean. Give us the ability to do these things, not eventually, but right now. God, thanks. We pray all this in your son Christ's holy, matchless, and powerful name. Amen.